thank you for coming out on a Wednesday night. Uh, you know, it's been said, folks that come on Wednesday night really love Jesus. So I, I, uh, <laughs> so I appreciate you all coming out. There's, there's Jason and Ann. Hi, hi, Susan. Good to see you guys. Thank you guys for coming. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, thank God for the word. Amen. Amen. Listen, Amen. never underestimate the power of the word of God that's preached and taught. Never underestimate that power. In fact, the Word of God has to be, you have to have a foundation of the Word of God before God can really move by the Spirit. Because without the Word, as, as has been said many times, without the Word, the Holy Spirit, you just, you just blow up. There's no <laughs> the Word. But without the Spirit, you dry up. But we need the Word of God and the Spirit of God. But never underestimate the power of the preached word, the word that's taught. You know, the Apostle Paul said it this way. Um, he said that the preaching of the word of God, the word of Christ, is foolishness to the world. But to those of us who are redeemed and saved, it's the power of God. Amen. Now, somebody said, well, it's just, we're just going to teach tonight. We're just going to preach tonight. Never have that attitude. Because when the word goes forth, power goes forth. You, you understand that? And the preaching and teaching of the Word of God transforms lives. And that's why to us, it, it, it's transformation. And the world says, what, what good is sitting there listening to somebody? How's that going to change my life? Well, when you're hearing the Word, it's transforming power. And that's why people can come to church one way and leave another. They come to church lost, they leave saved. They came to church sick, they leave healed. They come to church discouraged, they live, leave uplifted. Right? They come to church not knowing much, they leave knowing something. <laughs> right? And so they come in one way and leave another. So thank you. Thank you for being here tonight. And, and we have our expectations high tonight because of God's precious, holy, anointed word of God. Well, we've been talking about life in the spirit. And I know my beautiful wife kicked it off a couple weeks ago. Didn't she do a beautiful job a few weeks ago? Got us going. Pastor Mark, last week, Pastor Mark, thank you. For, for ministering along these lines. So I'm just going to continue uh, the life of the Spirit. And I, I want to go, I'm going to primarily look at the book of, of Galatians today, uh, tonight. The, the book of Galatians, which is uh, written to the churches of Galatia, le a letter written to the churches by the Apostle Paul under the divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Everybody say the Bible is God speaking to me? Somebody said, I wish God would speak to me not, uh, tonight. Well, we're going to read the Bible, right? It's God speaking to us, especially the New Testament letters or epistles written to the church, which is us. Now, I know the, 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 the main theme we're going to, in Galatians, we know the fifth chapter talks about the fruit of the Spirit, and we're going to get to that. But, you know, notice that that's in the fifth chapter. The Apostle Paul lines up everything, a foundation, before he gets to chapter 5. Notice there's four other chapters, right? And so we're going to kind of just look at the book of Galatians and what, what the Apostle Paul by the, the Holy Spirit is dealing with and then how he comes to the conclusion of how we walk in the Spirit. But I want to start off with Galatians 5 and verse 18 is the opening scripture here. Galatians 5, verse 18. 18, thank you, Father, for utterance tonight in the Word of God, in Jesus' name, amen. If, if, if you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. You got, we've got two choices, under law or the Spirit. How many of you know I'm going to choose being led by the Spirit? How about you? But you cannot, you cannot be both. You cannot be led by the Spirit or under the new covenant of grace by which the Holy Spirit's fully manifest and be under the law at the same time. So which is it? And so the Apostle Paul, he's, he's dealing with it right now in this whole book because the early church or, or this, at least uh, where he's dealing, these churches in Galatia, they were all Jews that got saved in the, in the, in the beginning. And, you know, later it was Gentiles, and now it's mostly all Gentiles, non-Jews. But it was most of the Jews, and the Jews at that time were under what? The law of Moses. And so the Apostle Paul, he's coming in, 
And by the way, he used to be a strict law keeper, right? He was all about it. He persecuted Christians heavily. He had his miraculous salvation experience. You remember that on the road and, and transformed. And, and so, so he's declaring the gospel of grace through Jesus. And these Jews are getting saved. And, and they, 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 they're saying, yes, Jesus is Lord. And yes, we receive him. But we must tell everyone, especially the, the Gentiles, the non-Jews, that they must be uh, under the law. And the Apostle Paul's like, oh, dude, really? You couldn't, have, you couldn't bear up under it. It was too weighty for you. Now you're asking these all Gentiles who are non-Jews who know nothing about the law. I said the Gentiles know nothing about the law of Moses. They only heard the good news of grace through Jesus and the power of the cross. And now these Jews are putting pressure on the, on, on, on the Gentiles you got to obey the law, and by the way, you got to get circumcised too. Mm. All the men, everybody go, ah, mm, awkward. Grown <laughs> <laughs> <Young> men. <laughs> and so the Apostle Paul's dealing with all this. And so let's go back to the, to the, the first chapter in Galatians. And, and so he writes, Galatians 1, verse 1, Paul, a, an apostle... Not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ. And God, the Father, who raised him from the dead. Notice the Apostle Paul, right from he said he establishes his credentials with God. And he says, I'm writing to you right now, and I want you to know God has equipped me. God is the one. I'm not speaking by my own agenda, by my own uh, resume, criteria. He says, I am an apostle. By God, the Father, and Jesus Christ. In other words, he's saying, I got something to say. Right? Yeah. To all the brethren who are with me. To the churches, those that are saved. So he begins, grace to you and peace from God, the Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the name of the Lord. I mean, that's a beautiful greeting right there. Many times I say it to you all, grace to you and peace. Right? From God, the Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ to be to all of you. This is what we have through Jesus who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age. Praise God. According to the will of God, our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So he just gives a little nutshell of the gospel. And he says, we're, 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 we're blessed through Jesus, saved, uh, forgiven. And then he goes to verse 6. He doesn't waste much time, and he gets right to the crux of the, the matter, the problem. He says, I'm amazed, I, I marvel, I'm amazed at you all who are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. He says, I'm shocked. I just got you saved not too long ago, and I told you about the beauties of God's grace. Now I'm shocked and amazed that you're turning to another gospel. Wow. Which is not another gospel, verse 7, but there are some who trouble you and who want to pervert the gospel. So there were people coming in the church and they were saying, the perversion was, as we said, they were saying, yes, Jesus, yes, thank God for the cross. But they perverted by saying, but now you've got to keep the law of Moses and do all these other things. And, and, and the Apostle Paul, he is not happy and he's saying it's a perversion and it's another gospel. How many of you know if anybody, and he goes on to, says, he says, if we are an angel, I don't care if anybody or even if someone says they see an angel from heaven preach any other gospel than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. Ooh. I wonder if he's serious about this. Any other gospel than the gospel of grace that through Jesus and the power of the cross, his shed blood, we have salvation and forgiveness of sin of, by grace, not of works or performance or keeping any law. And if anybody comes with something different, let him be a curse. And if that wasn't enough, the very next verse, as we said before, I say again, if anyone preaches the gospel, then what you have heard, let him be a curse. He prayed a double curse on anybody who brings a perverted gospel. Wow. Hmm. So you can see how serious he is. And then I'm just going to 
few verses skip to get to the crux of it. Then he says in verse 11, but I make known to you, brethren, now he's writing to the church, I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me was, uh, is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Praise God. The Apostle Paul establishing his credentials with God. He said, what I'm talking to you about the gospel of grace right now through Jesus, I got it from no man. I got this by direct divine revelation from Jesus himself. Wow. Uh, the Apostle Paul is a prophet of God. Prophets, uh, he said in another another. I will come to visions and revelations. Jesus appeared to the Apostle Paul many times in vision form. You can read about it in the Bible, especially in the book of Acts. What do you mean? I mean, he's just minding his own business, and all of a sudden, Jesus appears to him in a vision form. I don't mean necessarily physically, perhaps, but in a vision form, Jesus appears to him and talks to him and, and, and brings him revelation. And somewhere along the line, he got the gospel of grace directly from Jesus himself, and he's wanting the people to know about it. No one had a greater revelation of the grace of God than the Apostle Paul. Even Peter, when he got saved in the day of Pentecost and did some beautiful preaching, and in the early church you mentioned there's, there's not much about who you are in Christ in those early uh, sermons. There's not much about the grace of God and all that, but because they were growing. And even Peter in his letters, he talks about the Apostle Paul, and he says, our dear brother Paul, he says he's, he's, he's a powerful man of God. He writes things in the scriptures uh, that are hard to understand sometimes. Remember that? And one time, Peter, uh, Paul rebuked Peter to his face. He talks about it here. Because him and the other Jews were playing the hypocrite. They were, they were saying that trying to uh, say we're free from the law, but then the, when they were on, amongst Gentiles, they were saying, you keep the law. And Paul was not too happy. And, and, but he's establishing his credentials here that I am called, and, he's, and he learned the gospel of grace directly from Jesus himself. So let's go to Galatians chapter 2 and verse 16. He's presenting his case here. But in verse 16, he says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by what? Faith. By faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not, it wouldn't say not, not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law, no one or no flesh shall be justified. Wow. So Paul is trying to make it plain here that, that through the works or through the keeping of the law, no one is justified. Only by faith in the blood, which requires no works or no doing, but only through faith we are justified, or justified is just as if I'd never sinned. Can you see that? justified, just as if, I'd, as if I'd never sinned. So when we're justified by faith in Christ, we stand before God just as if I'd never sinned. Right? Clean, forgiven, washed, righteous, pure. And the Apostle Paul is none of, none of the law, none of the law of Moses. How many of you know that the law of Moses had a purpose? It's beautiful in its purpose. And it's, it's holy, it's clean, it's, it's pure, but it has no power to make anyone else pure or clean or holy. Because the standard is so rigid. Remember James said, if you break even one, one commandment, one law, you're guilty of breaking all of them. No one could do it. No one could. Except for the animal sacrifices, they all would have been finished. But thank God for that, which was a picture of Christ. So the law itself, the Apostle Paul says in another place, the law itself is the purpose for it is so that every mouth would be shut and that all would become 
guilty before God. In other words, the law brings everybody to the end of themselves to help them realize, you know what? Wow, I cannot do this. If I got to keep the law perfectly to have peace with God, I cannot do it. I, 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 I need a Savior. So the law was to, so that no one could say, uh, look how righteous I am. Look how holy I am. I, 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 I don't need Jesus. I can get there myself. But the law brings you to the end of yourself to say, I can't, I can't live a perfect life. I can't, I can't do it. I, I need a Savior. But before the law, that wasn't brought. But when the law came, sin was exposed. That's why Paul said the strength of sin is the law. And that's why the law leads us to Christ, he said. But once we get to Christ, we're no longer under that tutor. Now we're under the Spirit of God. Somebody say, praise the Lord. So I don't need that. That's why uh, Paul here in, in Galatians, I'm not going to take time to go there, he likens the, the law and grace to two covenants from the free woman Sarah to the Hagar, the bond woman. Remember that? He said there are two covenants, one from Mount Sinai, Hagar, which is Ishmael, which is bondage. The other, Sarah, the free woman, Isaac, is liberty. And he said there are two covenants, and they will not mix. You can't mix oil and water. You can't mix law and grace. So there's two covenants. And so he's saying, we don't need, we don't need Hagar to raise our kids. We need Sarah, grace of the free woman, of the spirit of God, if we're going to have victory in this life. So the law fulfilled its purpose. And by the way, Jesus fulfilled the law perfectly. He's the only one who filled the righteous requirements of the law. All, not only the Ten Commandments, but all 500 and 600 and some odd commandments, which a lot of them, by the way, were traditions. They weren't even from God. They just had like the washing of your hands and all this that Jesus said. Traditions of men make the word of God of no effect. But Jesus fulfilled the, the law perfectly, the only one. So therefore, he, were, he, he, he qualified to be our substitute. And he fulfilled it. And so because he fulfilled it and was nailed to the cross, then, then we're, we're, we don't have to be con concerned about it. That's what the Apostle Paul is trying to make. Listen, once a contract has been fulfilled, no more payments have to be made. If you pay off your house or pay off your car, I'd advise you stop making the payments. Right? It's fulfilled. It's done. Right? So the Apostle Paul's, why are you Gentiles that the law has been taken care of? Why do you keep trying to make payments? Through your own efforts, through your striving, through this man-made thing. No. So he's, he's presenting a case along these lines. Now, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. This is a, a very, a very powerful, famous scripture. Galatians 2, 20. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Wow, that's powerful truth. Amen. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in, by the faith of the Son of God, who gave himself for me. Praise God. That's who we are in Christ. We've been crucified with Christ to the law and to the sin and all this, and, but yet I'm still alive. But not me, Christ in me. I tell you, that's a beautiful philosophy to live by. I preached a message years ago. I'm going to get back to it. I cannot, but he can. What you cannot do, he can. I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can do it. Don't worry about it. You cannot, but he can through you. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I still live. I'm alive. Not me, but Christ in me. So when you come up against something, you say, I don't know if I can do this. You're right. You can't. I cannot, but he can. Whatever you're doing, family issue, financial issue, something on the job. I cannot, but you can, Lord, by the grace of God and by the power of God in me. And so then Paul says in verse 21 of Galatians 2, I do not set aside, the King James says frustrate, it's on the screen, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness comes by the law of Christ, that is died in vain. So how are we becoming right with God? How do we become righteous? How do we 
by, by love, but if you go back to trying to qualify or earn or deserve it, then you are frustrating the grace of God. Which means unmerited, unearned favor. Did you know that when you came into Christ, the day you got saved, you are fully in God's favor? At that very moment. Not after you get saved and then try to, you know, earn, try to figure, yes, we grow and yes, we learn. But we're growing and learning in all that Jesus has done for us. You are in your job right now. Wherever your work is, wherever you are, you need to have the attitude, when I go to work tomorrow, I just thank you, Lord, that I am in your favor right now. I have favor with God and, man, and everyone here. Yeah. Why? Because you're in Christ. So you can't, don't frustrate the God. Realize that God, and I, and I said this the other day because I was feeling bad about something like we all do and Maybe I should have blah, blah, blah. And, and, and I'm just, the Lord just whispered to me and in my spirit, I'm pleased with you right now. It brought a great peace to me. Because the Lord really after, he said, no, no, it's not about. It's because I see you through the lens of Jesus that you are, you are righteous by faith. You're forgiven. You're my beloved child. And so if you get away from that, then you're frustrating the grace of God. So both ends, you cannot qualify and don't disqualify yourself. Both, both are a problem. Yeah. In other words, you, if you qualify, man, I've been doing everything right, and thank God for doing everything right, we're all for it. We all should be growing, living a holy life, being fruitful as he's going to get to in a moment. But he establishes the fact that, that you cannot qualify. It's not by what you do, it's by what Jesus has done. And I say it over and over, when you, when you approach God, do not go on your own merit. Like the Apostle Paul says, everything I've accomplished, I've got a long line of credentials. I count them all rubbish. And only Jesus Christ and him crucified. He's, he's, my, he's the one who, this man. Then on the other side, then you, then you, you realize you, you, you can't qualify by, by, and on the other side, don't disqualify. Oh, I'm, I'm so, such a failure. I haven't done anything right. I feel bad. I don't deserve anything from God. That's just as bad. Now you're saying the blood's not good enough. His grace is not powerful enough. Grace is greater than your sin and your failures. Otherwise, we're all in trouble. I said we're all in trouble if that's not true. But yeah, but you don't know how many times, and yet yeah, never mind. Grace is greater. And when you understand the revelation of grace, it will lead you out of that sin or that bondage, according to the word of God. But if you don't have a revelation of that, you're going to repeat that cycle, shame and condemnation, and continue, continue on in that. So the Apostle Paul says, don't frustrate the grace of God. Right? We're not justified by what we do or by what we don't do, as you were in the law. Because under the law, it was all about doing, doing, doing. To get favor with God. Under the new covenant of grace, it's done, done, done because of Jesus. We'll get a long ways if we, if we understand that. So he's laying his foundation uh, to, these, to the church here. Now, where were we? Let's drop down to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 1. So Paul's continued. Foolish Galatians, please. He's going to come on. Who has bewitched you? I can't believe you're doing this, that you should, uh, should not obey the truth before whom I, Jesus Christ, was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. How, how are you backing up on this? This I want to learn from you. Did you receive, he asked him a question, did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? And the answer is, by the hearing of faith. How did you get saved? How did you receive the Holy Spirit? Did you do something? Did you keep some kind of formula? No. You heard something about Jesus. Did you know that the Apostle Paul says the law is not of faith? How many of you know that's in the Bible? Okay, I need two or three witnesses. How many of you know Paul said the law is not of faith? Right? Under the New Covenant. So in other words, so when we go back to the reading of the law for, the, for example, the Ten Commandments, no faith is coming to you. Paul said this in, in famous scripture we know, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 17. I mean, Romans 10, 17, quote it to me. Faith comes by hearing 
and hearing by the Word of God. But did you know that Word of God there at the end is literally the Greek word Christos? And some translations translate it that way. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of Christ. Christos in the Greek. Now the Word of God works fine too. But some, like, like many translations translate it properly, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of Christ. Because in this dispensation, if you want faith to come, you have to hear about Jesus and the power of the cross. If you read the Ten Commandments, no faith's coming. I'm preaching good right now. No faith is coming. Did you know when you look at the Ten Commandments, and again, let's remember why God gave the Ten Commandments to bring man to the end of himself. I can't keep them all. Jesus brought the law to a high person. He said, even if you look at a woman with, a, a, with adultery, in your, even if you look at her wrong, you co you've committed it. I mean, he took it to a higher standard so that all the religious holier than thou that say, I've never committed adultery. So if you even looked at someone, you're guilty. Can you give me that much at least? In other words, he's trying to make sure they all know I can't do it. I need a savior. But all the holier than I've kept everything. That was the rich young Euler's fault. I kept everything from my youth, you see. So he brought the law to, to a high place and, and so that everyone would realize I need to be saved. But, but getting back to the Ten Commandments, when you, did you know that the Holy Spirit, if you try to memorize the Ten Commandments, the Holy Spirit's not helping you. <laughs> well, what's the, what's, who can tell me the Sixth Commandment right now? How about the Fourth? Tell me the Seventh. Tell me the, most of us, we don't know because the Holy Spirit reminds us of Jesus because once we are saved, we are no longer under that law. The Apostle Paul says in the book of First, Second Corinthians that, that the, the law will bring uh, uh, condemnation. It's the ministry of death and the ministry of condemnation. First Corinthians 13 or, or 3, Second Corinthians 3. The law is the ministry of death and condemnation. It's done its job. And the only time I would give somebody the law today is if they tell me, I don't need Jesus. I got it all together. Now I'm coming at them with the full power of the law to break them down, to help them see they, 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 they don't have it all together. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust in your eyes? And if he said, if he said no, I said, quit lying to me right now. I mean, no, you're, not, you're less than perfect. You do not qualify on your own. You need Jesus. That's the purpose of the law. But now that we're in Christ, if we keep feeding on that, Paul says it's going to bring the ministry of death and condemnation because it reminds us of our sin rather than remind us in, grace reminds us of the cross and that we're righteous by faith with the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? So he's, where was I? Uh, Galatians chapter 3. And so he says, was it by the works of the law or by hearing of faith? Hearing of faith. That's how we receive the, are you so foolish? How be, now begun in the spirit? Begun in, in grace? You are now made perfect by the flesh or by keeping the law? Notice flesh is talking about law within context. We think of the flesh, the body. He's talking about the keeping the fleshly, the body, the law of doing. Have you suffered so many things in vain if now... If indeed it was in vain, in other words, you've been persecuted for being a Christian, and now does it mean nothing? Then he asked him another question in verse 5. Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you, the Holy Spirit to you, and works miracles among you. How many of you believe in miracles and want miracles in your life? How does he do it? Does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? It's the hearing of faith. In other words, you cannot receive miracles from God under the new covenant through the works of the law. By saying, Lord, I, I kept this commandment, I did this everything right today, and I've not, and I'm blah, 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 blah. And, and no, if you're going to receive a miracle from God, it's going to be by the hearing of faith. How does faith come? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. The new covenant revelation of the blood. When you preach the blood and the power of Christ and the cross and what Jesus has done for us, and the word, then that's how you receive miracles. Did you know that the religious leaders in Jesus' day, none of them got miracles? They, 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 were, they were law keepers. He called them whitewashed sepulchers. He was, 
as I said, self-righteousness is the mother of all sin. He was angry with them because they were self-righteous, holier than thou. I'm a law keeper. But all the sinners, harlots, prostitutes, social outcasts, the religious world says, I can't believe you, you minister to them. They're full of sin. But they knew they were sinners. And they knew they had nothing. They knew they needed Jesus' grace. And they said, you're right, I got nothing. And all those that had that attitude, the worst of the sinners, that's why Jesus was known as a friend of sinners. Because they knew, I got nothing, I need you, Jesus, I look to you. The woman caught in adultery and all this, they looked at Jesus and they received. So sin doesn't keep Jesus away, he's drawn to it. To those that say, I need to say, I'm a mess. And then when you receive grace, when you receive grace it not only delivers you and makes you free, but it sets you free from that bondage because then the woman in adultery, go, he says, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. She received the gift of no condemnation, then she had the power to go and sin no more. But the church wants to reverse it. How can you? As soon as you sin no more, then I won't condemn you. She has no power to. She has to receive grace, forgiveness. Then she has the power to go and sin no more. So we give people grace, not condemnation. And then they will, can go and sin no more. All right. So, so we receive, if we want miracles, we've got to receive by the hearing of faith. Praise God. I said glory to God forevermore. All right. Let's, let's uh, how are we doing on time? Okay, we're, 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 we're almost done here. Galatians 3. Let's go to... Galatians chapter 5, I'm going to skip over. Galatians 5, verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Now, most Christians will say, stand fast in Christ, don't be con- involved with sin again. And yes, we understand that, but he's talking about the law. Because if you get involved with the law, it's going to draw sin in your life. The, the bondage of the law, don't be yoked up with that again. And then... He goes on to say, indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. Again, the law, circumcised. All the males were circumcised on the eighth day because the Christians, the Jewish Christians were telling the Gentiles, you've got to get circumcised. It won't help you. I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. So if you're going to go through with this, then you've got to keep the whole thing. Let me know how it works out. It's not good. Verse 4, you have become estranged from Christ if you have this attitude. You who attempt to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. Wow, that's how serious it is. To be re- no wonder Jesus was so upset with the religious law keepers. For we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through Love. Isn't that beautiful? Like I said, the, the Ten Commandments and the law on a piece of two stones, cold, lifeless. No love, no intimacy, no relationship. Thou shalt, thou shalt not. Thou shalt, thou shalt not. There's no, no intimacy there. There's no, it's just cold. How many of you like to be married to somebody? All they can do is say, thou shalt and thou shalt not. Thou shalt and thou shalt. Just bossing you around. Never mind. Let me love on you. Let me show you grace. Let me just. It's all about do's and don'ts. How many of you know that relationship's not going far? Right? And that's what you get if you just put yourself under law. Then you are, there's no relationship. But in Jesus, remember in the new covenant, he writes his laws on our hearts and on our minds. And we have faith works by love. Now, the love of the Father. Now we have a relationship with God who loves us and who doesn't give us a bunch of legalistic stuff. But he just says, I love you and by my grace. And from that love and from that grace and the Holy Spirit in us, we live a life that glorifies God. Not from some cold thou shalt and thou shalt not. Does that make sense? And so that's why Paul is just driving this home. Verse after verse after, uh, after letter, he's trying to help them to understand these truths. And so he goes on to say, 
in, let's drop down to verse 16 in, in Galatians 5. So then he's wrapping it up. He says, this I say, walk in the Spirit. Now we're getting to it, right? Remember to our, 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 uh, our theme today. Walk in the Spirit. And when you understand these truths, walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But if you go back into law and performance and all these uh, legalistic stuff, how many of you have met legalistic Christians? Where you got to toe the line. And if you don't toe the line, God's mad at you. You're not going to be blessed. And you got to do everything just right. And they're constantly nagging you and nagging you. How many of you know God is not like that? He loves us. When we do wrong, what happens? The Holy Spirit convicts us, Jesus said, of righteousness. Because you, you do not see me. Because when Jesus was with his disciples, when they did wrong, they saw his face of love and grace. But when I go away, the Holy Spirit will come and he will convict and stir you of righteousness. In other words, reminding you of the righteousness of God in Christ. Your sins have been forgiven. You don't have to fall back into that. You are loved and forgiven. You have a relationship with the Lord. Now you can move forward. That's walking in the spirit. And you not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit. And the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to the one to the other. So that you do not do the things that you wish. So he, he's, he's talking about there, there, there's, a, there's a battle there. But if we yield to that flesh or to the law, then we're going to do the things that we, we do not wish to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Back to where we were in the beginning. It's kind of like how the movie, you know, in the movie when you see one scene, and then they say, five years earlier, that's what we're doing tonight, all right? So now we're back to the original scene, and we're going to finish out, all right? Okay. And, and so the works of the flesh are evident. And again, these are works, these are things we do if we, if we go back under the law and let that dominate us. Are evident. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, all bad stuff. Idolatry, sorcery, hatred, content, jealousies, outbursts of wrath. People who are, are not grace-minded but law-minded, they're, they're subject to all this. Drunkenness, murders, and the like. Somebody said, well, at least he didn't get my favorite little sin in there. Yeah, he did, right there, and the like. They cover, covered all of it, all right? <laughs> Which I tell you before and also tell you in times past that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So those who can do these things with no conscience and whatnot, they're, they're not amongst the redeemed. But the fruit of the Spirit, now we're getting to it, right? This is what we have under grace. That's what you get under law, the flesh, and this is what it produces. Now, if we're in the Spirit, under grace and the Holy Spirit and the new covenant, this is what it's going to produce in your life. Love, joy, praise God. Now, beautiful, peace. Anybody using peace and joy? Long-suffering, you don't lose your kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. There's a whole message, all those beautiful attributes that we have in Christ. Self-control against such, there's no, no law can stop that. Those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So if we're in Christ, we're in his grace, we understand these things, we're crucifying all the things of the flesh. If we live in the spirit, let us walk it out in our life, right? Let it come out in our, in our lives, in, in our walk with God. Let's be a, a light. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. Now, in closing, our time's almost gone. We're going to go to the final chapter. The Apostle Paul's wrapping things up here with his letter. In verse 12, and he says, As many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh. Hmm. In other words, we've we, we got to impress God somehow or impress everyone else. We're trying to make a good showing. Now, we're not talking about... Because he's talking about with human efforts. You understand? When you bear the fruit of the Spirit, you're not striving. Because when you allow the Spirit of God and the Word of God and what Jesus has done from your reborn human spirit and you're walking in that, uh, you're not striving for that. How many of you know if I tell Cindy, it's really hard for me to tell you this, I'm really 
trying to really mean this, but I love you. I mean, you know, she's not going to be too happy with that. I know I'm supposed to love you, so I'm really going to work at it. I'm, I'm really try to mean it the best I can. Huh? That's not going to impress her. Right? No, she wants a sincere from the heart. I love you. I, I, I want to help. I want to bless you. I want to serve you. It's, it's not hard for me. It's what I, what I enjoy doing. To love you and to serve you and to help you or, or anyone. And so, uh, we're not, but if, if you're under grace, and that's how it is with, with God. You're not trying to put up a, a good showing in the flesh, because you're from the Spirit. You, you love Him, and you honor Him, and He honors you. But a good showing from the flesh, you're striving, self-effort, you're trying to qualify, you're trying to earn something through the law. So he, he, he makes one last plea. Those of you trying to make a good showing in the flesh, try to, with your own efforts, these would compel you to, and th these that would compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. Wow. So, so in other words, all these Jewish Christians were telling these Gentiles to get circumcised, and when they did, they're going, hey, that's shocking my belt. I got one. Woo. I did it, Lord. I got one more for you. And he's saying, no, none of that. Verse 13, for even those who are circumcised keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. Wow. All these guys that are mixture, law and grace, they're, they're trying to Get marks with, with God. Verse 14, but God forbid that I should boast except, what? In the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Wow. Praise God. He's saying, I got nothing on my own. I got nothing. I know nothing. I have nothing. I boast only, not of my own efforts, not everything I've done, not all the people that I've gotten saved, not all the people, all the work I've done, all the churches I've established, all this. I boast in none of that. I only boast in the Lord Jesus Christ and the power of the cross who has transformed my life. Praise God. It's been crucified to me. For in Christ neither circumcision avails nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. Praise the Lord. That's through Jesus, through his grace. And as many as walk according to this rule or this truth or this revelation, who understand these, wrapping it up, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the God of Israel. How many of you want that from God, right? Peace and mercy and his love, his grace, all the things that come from God, then we have to honor what the Apostle Paul is talking about. From now on, let no one trouble you. Let no one trouble me, he's saying. Earlier he said, don't let him trouble. Now he's saying, let no one trouble me or try to come against me. For I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. What's he saying? Those that preach law and law giving, there's no persecution. None. Because the flesh likes to say, I've done something, I've accomplished. That's kind of the way the world is. So if, when you preach law, by the way, every other religion in the history of humanity, and there are thousands of them, are all works-based, law-driven, if you will. You have to do something to get something. All of them. Go down the list, you have to perform. The gospel, the Christianity, is the only one where Jesus, someone else, did everything. And all you have to do is receive. You don't get persecuted for doing something. You get persecuted for saying, I received everything and I did nothing. He did every, all of it. I receive it by faith, by grace through faith. That will draw persecution. And Paul says, I bear on my, listen, you see these stripes on my back? Whip marks, beaten. I bear in my body the mark of Jesus Christ because I've been beaten and I've been whipped because I preach this pure gospel of grace and I want you to know I'm not backing off of it. Don't let anybody trouble me anymore because I already, I already got my marks. I'm staying with Jesus, I'm staying with the gospel and I'm staying with his grace. Praise God. 
And then he closes and he says, Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Praise the Lord. Father, we're so thankful for your word tonight, for these precious truths. And I, I pray all of us, as we trust in what Jesus has done for us, Lord, we know that that will empower us to have a beautiful relationship with you, to serve you out of gladness, to serve you out of a, out of a heart of thanksgiving, not out of fear, not out of pressure that we'll, we would be punished or trying to impress anybody. But Father, we serve you. We bear the fruit of the Spirit because of what Jesus has done for us. And so, Father, I pray we would get a revelation of that, not only in our relationship with you, but in our relationship with others, that we would show them love and grace just as you have shown us. And so, Father, we know as we take this posture in the Spirit that you work miracles among us, you move powerfully in our midst, Lord. The power, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is released in our midst in every way in our families. And so, Father, I thank you for that. Help us, Lord, to walk and live not, at, not just in the house, but, Father, in our lives and in our workplaces and with our families, wherever we go, we are walking in the Spirit of God. We have joy. We have peace. We shine for you, Father, that others may see that Jesus is Lord. Father, we thank you for it. If you receive that, say amen. 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 Okay, God bless you guys. Thanks for coming. You're dismissed.